Welcome to Intesa San Paolo On Air, a new English language insight series produced in conjunction with the University of Oxford, where we embark on global conversations with global leaders. My name is Rupert Younger, and in this, our fourth episode, we build on the last episode, part one of this double bill, to examine the challenges that we're now facing with the commercialization of space. So in this episode, we raise some of the key questions that need to be resolved as we humans start to exploit space for commercial reasons. We explore the opportunities and challenges around ESG and sustainability in space. We will open up questions relating to the regulation of space and the need to update international law. We ask how space should be governed, tackling geopolitics and global security concerns, as well as the growing problem of space junk. Perhaps most critically, how might it be possible to achieve international consensus on all this when we still have no consensus back here on how to live together peacefully on Earth? So where should we start? I turned to the University of Oxford's Mark Van Tresca, one of the best thinkers on space governance and innovation today. The origins of space are literally about these questions, these unresolved questions of governance and who gets to claim Mars, who gets, you know, which country is going to claim the moon or Mars or asteroid mining. And again, these are old questions of territorial rivalries on the Earth that are getting exported into space. So who should be allowed to claim space? Here we are talking about space colonialism where countries vie to own new territories that may provide them with some form of strategic advantage. The uncharted nature of much of space activity is much like deep sea minerals mining, mining for minerals, which has been a domain for 30 years. Countries vying to be able to claim that mineral wealth at the bottom of the ocean and building technologies to do that. There are probably 10 countries today that have submersibles able to do that kind of deep sea mining the melting of the Arctic and the consequent opening up of shipping lanes above Canada and through into Russia, those are contested spaces. Those are Ostrom-like governance of the commons problem. Do we then need to start at first principles, giving consideration to ethics and governance, given that space is no longer just a place for national governments, but also for profit-seeking corporations? We're in a time of technologies that both promise enormous benefit and possibility, but that also require attention to ethics and to governance. Uh, and I think this last point, you know, brings us into a really interesting debate that's going on today, which is this question of how do we, how do we as a, a space-faring world, people often use the term space-faring to describe countries that have established capabilities and possibilities to go forward. The reality is we are also spacefaring corporations. And so we get into this classic set of tensions around countries and companies that are equally competitive in terms of both accessing space today, potentially uh, developing the opportunities in space, and potentially damaging space in ways that are long-lasting and consequential. This lack of governance is something that many people working in the industry are acutely aware of. As space becomes more and more cluttered, so too does the need for some form of regulation become a critical requirement. I turn to Nick Fox, a senior executive steeped in the space business who has worked with Richard Branson for close to two decades for his take on this. Governance is really important for a couple of, of key reasons. One is We've seen this explosion in the last decade of, of um, satellites, and we'll see even more being uh, launched into space. And so that creates enormous amount of assets that are floating around and some that will become um, obsolete. So we need regulation to ensure that space is not cluttered and left with debris. To get into this topic, I started with launching rockets into space. How can such an energy intensive activity be done in a way that's environmentally responsible? I spoke with Melissa Thorpe, head of Spaceport Cornwall, which is one of a number of new launch sites that offer a horizontal launch capability where rockets are attached to the underbelly of planes and launched at 35,000 feet. 
Launching this way reduces the fuel intensity, reducing the overall carbon footprint involved. For me, there's a responsibility on that. You know, what, how are we going to take the UK into space? You know, is it um, in a way that's slightly different than what's been done for the last 50 years? Can we go to space in a more responsible way where we consider the environment, where we consider ethics, um, where we consider, you know, protecting democracy in space and, and regulating space in a way that's fair and accessible to all. One of the businesses using the new horizontal launch service offered by Spaceport Cornwall is Space Forge, an entrepreneurial new business operating out of South Wales. I'm Josh Weston. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Space Forge. Space Forge is an in-space manufacturing company building the world's first returnable and relaunchable satellite platform the Forge Star, to create materials simply impossible to make on planet Earth. I asked Josh for his perspective on the importance of operating in space in a responsible way. So that's the reason we started Space Forge. Uh, so our, tag, our tagline um, and, the, and the mission that we created, I mean, okay, we, we started, our original mission had way more swear words in it, uh, but in our A-B testing didn't go down so well. So our mission became making space work for humanity. And, and truly, we mean that. We don't, this isn't about look how wonderful, wonderfully carbon negative we are because we bought some woodland and offset all of our previous emissions. Since day one at Space Forge, we've been calculating our carbon footprint. This comes down to the first Domino's pizza we ordered um, when we got set up in my co founder Andrew's garage um, and started brainstorming all the way up till now, where we have like a climate champion who changes once a quarter and monitors the company's CO2 output. The reason being that as Space Forge, we want to become the world's first truly carbon negative space company, that the products that we create in space, when they're deployed operationally, prevent more CO2 from being created than they took to produce. So here on the issue of sustainability, we need to first recognise that there are huge opportunities within space to create valuable environmental and sustainability contributions to life here on Earth. Well, I think we still, you know, space has is, is uniquely positioned to provide data that can really uh, bring genuine benefit from a climate change perspective, from a, a food security, food sustainability perspective. It can also provide connectivity to remote regions as well, so it can enable um, countries to build industries in remote areas. So I think it is probably the single most important enabling technology we have out there and will have for many generations to come. That was Rob Despera, a partner at Seraphim Space, who heads up early stage investments. Seraphim describes itself as the global leader in space tech investment, and they manage the world's first space tech investment fund. To get a first-hand sense of what entrepreneurs are working on today, I spoke with Natalia Efremova, co-founder and chief technology officer of Deep Planet, a precision viticulture business that uses satellite data to help wine growers better manage their crops. Definitely, we can monitor organic carbon. So since in our days, everyone is interested in carbon sequestration, that might be a very good application for farmers to understand how sustainable their farming practices, how much carbon is captured in the soil, what they can do to improve the conditions uh, on their fields. And maybe if they can get extra money for keeping their land sustainable and sequestering a certain amount of carbon on their land as well. Even Spaceforge, which is focused on manufacturing, can credibly claim to be working on technology that meets more stringent ESG criteria. I asked Josh Weston to explain why his technology can be described as ESG friendly. It is best described as Mary Poppins from space. It allows us to return much, much more gently than any of the existing solutions on the market, lower weight, um, lower refurbishment costs, um, and importantly, that technology allows us to bridge the gap between both the in-space manufacturing piece of Space Forge and the ability that you can actually return this technology uh, and the products you've made in a fashion gentle enough that they survive re-entry and to locations where your customers are. Um, if you can return one ton a year, great, but if you can only return that one ton in one go to one location, that's actually very difficult 
for terrestrial manufacturing industries to get on board with. There are many such businesses, it turns out, who, like Spaceforge or Deep Planet, are crafting their entire strategies around ESG criteria with a clear focus on creating ESG positive outcomes from their activities. Rob Desper's Seraphim Space spends his time seeking out promising companies who deliver exactly these outcomes. From our perspective, we first invested into a company called AST Space Mobile um, about three, four years ago. They floated on a NASDAQ market in the US last year for a little over two billion. Their technology will provide direct to mobile phone 5G connectivity anywhere on Earth without the need for an antenna or any change in software as well. So if you look at Elon Musk and Starlink, that requires an antenna and you obviously need software, new software on your phone as well. So I think from Matt's um, uh, ESG perspective, that is going to provide genuine impact. Interesting stuff. Does he have more like this in his portfolio? Another uh, exciting one we've done, which is a UK startup, is the world's first thermometer in space. So it's an infrared satellite constellation. And they can see at building level, they can do thermal footprinting. So you can look at um, a government, could look at thermal footprints of a row of terraced houses or, or uh, businesses on an you know, industrial estate or a city for that matter and understand the climate impact and how they can better look at insulation. But equally within financial services, you can understand the output of a factory on any given day. Are they producing more iPhones or less iPhones just by their heat signature? Or what type of plane was that that just took off? When did it take off? So there's an immense amount of things you can do when you've got a thermal footprint. ESG, it seems, is already becoming a critical aspect of how business is conducted in space. This is interesting and begs the question why. I asked Luca Rossettini, CEO of Deorbit, one of the longer established space companies whose focus is on space logistics done sustainably. His ambition starts with becoming the DHL of space and extends beyond that to cloud computing and in satellite space repair. So history is always repeating. Uh, let, let's look at what is happening right now on Earth. If you don't work on ESG, uh, you know, if you don't show that you are um, working on sustainability aspects, you will not get any money from any investors. You will not get any customers. You will have a lot of troubles working with the government, right? So it took like 10 years. I, I do remember I started working in the sustainability business in 2005. So, you know, it took like 15 years, like 17 years, right? But now, now we see in space is going to be extremely faster. And the reason why it's going to be faster is because, um, um, you know, on Earth, if you pollute a river, it will take probably five to seven years to pollute the, the sea or the ocean. In space, you pollute one orbit, 90 minutes after, you will have several orbits completely polluted around the Earth. Investors have emerged as one of the most unlikely champions of ESG. Far from the idea that investors are only interested in profit, it seems clear that the majority of investors are investing specifically with ESG criteria in mind, and especially so in the new emerging market that is space today. From our perspective, ESG is critical, and we take all of our uh, companies through an ESG um, decision tree when we look to invest into them. This is a core part of our analysis with these companies. And we look to make sure that whatever actions they're currently taking are mitigating any negative impacts in terms of launch and areas like that. But also we assess them against the United Nations 17 SDGs and space maps across all 17. And in every case, all of our portfolio companies map to a minimum of one SDG. Rob Despera. So space commerce is certainly not without its ESG challenges. One of the biggest is what Geographical, the magazine of the UK's Royal Geographical Society, calls the Space Junk Age. In its October 2022 issue, 
it states that as more and more satellites and spacecraft are launched into space, small bits of debris are becoming a problem, potentially risking future operations essential for monitoring the Earth. Writer Catherine Early points to 8,800 tonnes of space debris orbiting the Earth today, including 1,950 discarded rocket stages, 2,850 defunct satellites, and over 1 million fragments of between 1 and 10 centimetres in size. You can imagine just how such fragments, moving at 36,000 kilometres per hour, could smash into a fully functioning satellite with devastating consequences. To put this in context, European Space Agency statistics state that 81% of orbital objects move through the low Earth orbit at modal average relative velocities 20 times faster than an AK-47 bullet. Space junk, it's rattling around outside in our orbit and it's causing some damage. So back in 2009, we saw the first crash between two satellites. A, a Iridium satellite phone that was operated by the US crashed into an old Russian Cosmos satellite. Uh, and when they crash, they produce 10,000 pieces of debris. So space debris has become one of the biggest growing challenges emerging from the commercialization of space. What can be done about this? You know, the minute you start to get um, politicians talking about it, and even up to our now king, but when he was the prince, he, you know, visited Astroscale. And then he spoke at a conference that we were at in the summer where he challenged us as an industry to not treat space as we're treating our oceans, for instance. And he wants the UK to take a global lead in, in space debris mitigation. And I think when you have somebody like that challenging the UK to be a leader in it, that will make a difference. That was Spaceport's Melissa Thorpe. Astroscale, a Japanese company dedicated to the removal of debris in space, is just one of the many companies emerging in this area. End-of-life satellite removal is important not just because it is space junk, but because debris impacts the performance of satellites today. Deorbit tells me that satellite companies are already working on engineering design solutions to be able to work with in-space debris removal companies. So they are already putting, some of these companies that are already installing special interfaces on their satellites. They're already in orbit, uh, like uh, OneWeb, for example. There are more than 300 satellites already with an interface in space, uh, ready to be served by like active debris removal companies like uh, the Orbit, uh, Astroscale, uh, Clear Space in the future, right? So this is already happening, and this is the first layer. Of course, this is not a solution for the entire problem because uh, the, the vast majority of debris, it's still there, and no one is going to pay for today. Cleaning up space debris is undoubtedly a huge problem, threatening to make space a place that is unmanageable for a commercial enterprise. Sometimes people talk about the Kessler effect. The Kessler effect is an idea that says we're, we're polluting space. We're, we're throwing so much stuff into space, which then creates de debris of various kinds. Uh, everything from the size of a school bus, a, a, a rocket, a leftover rocket shell the size of a school bus, to literally millions of tiny bits of metal a millimeter, two millimeters in diameter, uh, which of course are moving at 15,000 miles an hour, which makes them extremely, extremely dangerous, not only for existing uh, uh, objects in space like the space station, but also eventually, and this is the Kessler effect, eventually making any kind of navigation into space that is launched into low Earth orbit, implausible, dangerous, difficult, and eventually unnavigable. That's Oxford's Mark Ventresca. So maybe what's required here is some form of regulation. I spoke again with Nick Fox. I think there's going to be more and more contested areas in space. Up till now, it's been fairly um, harmonious. But as you see global tensions rise and the ability also for people to shoot down satellites, you will see regulation being needed to protect those assets in space in the same way as we have protections for sovereign countries. So I think the growing number of assets in space will need some sort of regulation. And I think, unfortunately, growing political tensions will create the need for some sort of regulation um, to ensure that people have preserved them. Hopes that regulation can be the solution by itself, however, seem muted. Spaceport Cornwall's Melissa Thorpe, for one, 
sees the vibrancy of the new space economy moving just too fast for the regulations to catch up by themselves. Perhaps this is just how markets develop, with a dynamic interplay between market competition and market regulation. Actually, markets are fundamentally about rule systems, uh, whether they're financial markets uh, with, uh, with market makers in them, or whether they're large markets around new forms of science. The argument is that markets are fundamentally understood not as aggregations of lots of actors doing stuff, but really as uh, rule systems imposed and or shaped by one or another authority, either by convention and negotiation, by state actors, by large markets. But the core idea is markets are rule systems. The rule systems establish who counts as an actor, what, what can they do, what's seen as legitimate or fair. Oxford's Mark Ventresca again. Luca Rossettini from Deorbit agrees that markets will play an important role. And he personally is in discussions with some of the regulatory bodies, putting forward a proposal for space junk removal. So our idea is to say uh, every satellite operator today, they, they, in order to operate the satellites, they need to have a frequency license. That typically it's given by the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. Um, when you do that, you uh, why not declaring also how many years the satellite is going to stay in orbit? Let's say you want to operate the satellites for, for five years, and then you also say, you know, and uh, it will take three years for me to remove it, to like to get rid of the satellite. So you declare five plus three. You pay nothing during the five plus three years. You, you run your business, you make your money, and uh, you accomplish the business plan that you have. But if you stay in orbit w- one month more, then you start paying a, a, a waste tax, right? So that, uh, and this waste tax is collected and used to pay like companies that are going to remove the, all the other garbage that is in orbit. So that's super interesting. And I, for one, will be watching to see if this idea of a fund starts to catch hold. Other commercial companies are also engaging to secure some form of regulatory framework. Rob Desper from Seraphim Space. We've also invested into a company called Privateer, which is doing space debris tracking in the space domain environment there. Uh, and that company, the co-founder is the Apple co-founder, Steve Wozniak as well. So we're looking at the both in terms of uh, mitigating the problem and also managing and mapping it as well. But also what can we do on Earth from a regulatory environment? How can we be involved in that? One of the other problems identified in my research is that space law is now outdated. The Outer Space Treaty came into effect on the 10th of October 1967. As of this year, 112 countries are parties to the treaty, while another 23 have signed the treaty but have not yet completed ratification. Space law initially concerned itself with the question, to whom does outer space belong? And to date, nearly 60 years later, this has still not been answered. The history of space law revolves around the conflict between East and West at governmental levels. But today, space law needs to catch up to the reality that it is companies as well as governments that are now commercialising space. Oxford's Mark Ventresca explains the current situation. Space right now, space law, and the the jurisdictions in space are governed by a few conventions dating from the 1960s and 1970s. Recently, uh, efforts called the Artemis Accords, recently multilateral efforts to begin to imagine that. But in this case, space as a domain, as a territory, if you will, is relatively ungoverned. That is evident, and that's part of the challenge of space debris. The, because nobody has any real reason to restrict uh, their use of space launching satellites and the, the resulting debris. Um, this is a classic case of something that political scientists and economists have called the tragedy of the commons. What all this means is that the problem of a lack of applicable law or any form of consistent and agreed market architecture puts more pressure on there being a new international regulatory consensus. But who could lead this? Nick Fox. I don't know if it kind of ends up in uh, something like the United Nations. Um, 
because of you've got this kind of um, sovereignty issue, or whether there's a scientific body that will look at um, at the at the regulation. Rob Desperate from Seraphim agrees, but he points to the obvious difficulty of achieving anything like some sort of international consensus on this, especially now. I think any solution is ultimately going to be led by the United Nations again. And it is incredibly important that we bring all of the different space agencies into that conversation. You know, we need to make sure we're protecting it from a sustainability perspective, but also as assets become increasingly expensive, increasing, increasingly important as well, particularly from a, a national resilience perspective, we need to have a code of conduct. We need to think about what the highway code is up there as well. We need to think about space situational awareness. We need to think about that uh, space traffic management system. Rob's national security and resilience comment speaks also to the geopolitical issues surrounding the governance of space. If we fail to agree the market architecture for space soon, we may encounter a new phenomenon that I'm referring to as space for bad. I discussed this with my Oxford colleague, Mark Ventresca. Space for bad could, could include things like the nefarious use of space in defense terms, firms that are contributing to potentially nefarious uses of space. It could also include firms and agencies that are contributing to space debris, to the long-term lack of navigability. It could also uh, be involved for firms that are, that are using space for what look like naive or innocent uses that ultimately have more pernicious uses, right? So that term space for bad, which we're going to, we're going to attribute to you, Rupert, that term space for bad is a very big category, the contents of which we're only dimly beginning to notice now. The emerging problem, the idea of space for bad, whether inadvertent or deliberate, will of course drive the sort of regulatory architecture that we design. Space for bad, you know, I love your term, space for the bad is going to become a, a growing category of activity and it's going to get a lot of attention. And then, and this, you know, you know this already, this is why you're saying it that way. What's going to happen is we're going to end up regulating, we're going to try to regulate space for bad and in doing so stymie or obstruct or limit space for good at the same time. The commercialization of space offers such huge promise but is also racked with such big questions around the governance of this crucially important new marketplace. What is clear is that the market participants of today are working on a dizzying array of applications that will improve life on Earth and also will enable exploration of space for space over time. But I also believe that we can be optimistic that these bold entrepreneurs are also imagining a future for the commercialization of space done in a sustainable way. Luca Rossettini of Deorbit. So let me say let me say something that I think it's 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 really important. So what we let so I believe there are three pillars uh, for the evolution of the space sector. So one we already mentioned is uh, space logistics. Uh, the other one is the space cloud. Uh, that will you know enable and the third one the third pillar is uh, cyber security because satellites are going to become more and more software and so cyber security is going to be a pillar of the evolution there is an enabling factor for these pillars that is the circular space economy that's uh, extremely important so all the companies that are uh, willing to embrace these pillars working according to the uh, uh, space circular economy, they will be successful. So we are quite literally in new territory on all of this and securing the future of the space economy in a way that ensures it is exploited responsibly is one of the major challenges of our age. I will leave the last word on this with Melissa Thorpe of Spaceport Cornwall. I think for me, as long as the motivation is to um, use space, harness the power of space to help our planet and the people on our planet, then I'm up for it. Um, I think there's still a ways to go with, you know, with um, regulations. I think there's a ways to go with the investment needed in some of these startups. Um, but for me, yeah, I, I, exactly what you just said. I think you're you're just seeing some, just a lot of excitement, but it's backed up by some just in such intelligent and and talented people that can actually take Star Wars and be like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. 
And and again, Space Forge is a great example. Yeah, we can we're looking at building stuff in space, and you're like, right, okay, <laughs> we're doing this then. Um, so it's it's real, but yeah, as long as it's done in a way that that is is responsible, then then we're here for it. I hope you have enjoyed this two part podcast on the commercialization of space. One thing that is for sure is that there are both huge opportunities and huge challenges involved. I confess to now being a new space junkie. And so I, for one, will be watching closely as the melange of crazy dreamers, bold financiers and governance gurus attempt to work all this out to make the commercialization of our skies work sustainably for all.